So for our, so for our next talk, uh, we have Matt, uh, who's going to talk about um, a tamer-based goroutine concurrency uh, primitive. Mm -hmm. Matt is a systems, Matt is a distributed systems engineer at Fastly, uh, and regularly contributes to open source uh, networking application uh, libraries. We can, yeah, go. Um, please remember to post your questions. Um, if you have any questions, we don't have. We'll pick uh, the first few that we have uh, in the because of time. Uh, welcome, much. Excellent. Thank you so much. Happy to be here with you all. Uh, welcome. So, hi, I'm Matt Lair. Today, I'm going to share the lessons I've learned about Go concurrency and timers while building out a package I call Sched Group, which is short for Scheduler Group. You can find me on GitHub and Twitter at MDLayer, and the slides and code examples from this talk will be available at my talks repository on GitHub. I've also recently started streaming Go and network programming on Twitch, so please stop by and join the chat. It's a lot of fun. The SCED group package allows for delaying the execution of a Go routine until after a specified point in time. So the new constructor here is going to create a group, which will allow cancellation via context. The inner loop will schedule Go routines that print a number to the screen every 500 milliseconds, and finally, the waits method will wait for all the scheduled tasks to complete. So if I run this, you'll see we get about two numbers printed to the screen every second or so. So why build out a package that will only make your code slower? This seems kind of wrong, right? Sometimes you have to follow someone else's rules. My current side project is CoreRad, which is a modern take on an IPv6 router advertisement daemon. The SCED group package originated within the CoreRad repository before being factored out on its own. So CoreRed and IPv6 are not the focus of today's talk, but you can learn more about these by checking out my talks page or joining me in the networking channel on Gopher Slack. CoreRed implements the neighbor discovery protocol and the NDP RFC requires us to delay certain responses for a specified period of time. For multicasts, we can only send a router advertisement every three seconds. For unicasts, we have to delay each response by a random time between zero and 500 milliseconds. As a first pass, let's implement this logic using time.after. We'll create a wait group and prepare it to synchronize five Go routines. The Go routines will print a number to the screen every 500 milliseconds. Once all of the Go routines are finished, we print done to the screen. So if I run this example, you'll see it appears pretty much identical to the one I showed you earlier. So now that we have a prototype, what would it take to add context cancellation support to this prototype? Suppose we want to schedule a million tasks to atomically increment an integer, but also halt the work early once all of the Go routines have been created. If we run this example, this will take just a sec probably. We can see that some portion of the tasks did complete before they were canceled, but what are most of these Go routines doing while they wait for one second to elapse? Pprof is one of the best Go debugging and performance analysis tools, and this command will produce a nice graph of Go routine activity in our program. As we can see, the majority of the Go routines are parked and doing absolutely nothing other than consuming memory while our program is running. So these prototypes are small and easy to comprehend, but I think we can improve on the idea by limiting the number of Go routines and timers, which will immediately block on a task. It's worth noting that Go 114 was released with a significant rework to the runtime timer code. I started building out Sched Group during the 113 cycle, so perhaps some of my concerns about timer efficiency are less of an issue with 114. So we've kind of run into a classic programming trade-off here. How do we balance efficiency versus convenience for our users? Can we really have the best of both worlds? by only spinning up Go routines as needed, while also allowing for context cancellation for callers. For the first library iteration, I decided to try a worker pool, worker pool approach with a fixed number of worker Go routines. Our first goal is to provide a concise API which supports context cancellation. The group is our top level type, and the new constructor creates a group while also spinning up our Go routine workers. I decided to create 32 Go routines in a buffered channel to enqueue tasks with the intent of providing more flexibility later if needed. The exported methods of our API are delay and wait. Delay will schedule the execution of a function at or after the input delay. I mentioned the at or after part specifically because the scheduling is best effort and might be influenced by events such as Go routine scheduling or garbage collection. In practice, this, is not, this has not been a problem for me in my applications. Wait will block until all the worker Go routines complete, allowing external synchronization by the caller. The worker method is used to create a worker Go routine which will run and consume work until CTX is canceled, and work is called by each worker whenever a task is received. It will either wait for context cancellation or for the caller specified delay to elapse. When the delay time elapses, the task is run. Putting this all together, if I run this example, 
You can see we've come up with a demo which behaves identically to our naive version. Looking at the PROF Go routine output for this demo, we can see the number of Go routines is stable, with 32 workers and also a few extras for things like PROF and such. Overall, this seems like a nice starting point for the SCED group package. The internal code is concise and clean, we can support context cancellation, and there's no unbounded use of Go routines. However, there are a couple of cons as well. Although it isn't much, the idle worker Go routines do consume, consume some system resources. Because of the fixed number of workers, it's possible to block the color when calling delay if the internal buffer channel is already full of tasks. So this is an excellent start, but I decided to keep iterating to see what I could come up with. I started asking some folks in the performance channel on Gopher Slack for advice, and Egon Elbre came up with a couple of excellent ideas that heavily influenced the final design of the package. First, we decided to investigate a timer polling approach, with the goal of having a central monitor Go routine that handles timers and Go routine creation. In order to determine which tasks should be scheduled first, we make use of a min heap with Go's container heap package. To make use of a heap, we have to create a type which implements the sort interface, and a couple of extra methods on top of that to push items onto and pop them off the heap. We wrap our task type in a slice type called tasks, and we can use that to implement heap interface. If you've ever implemented sort interface, several of the methods are identical. Tasks which are scheduled earlier are considered lesser in the min heap, and push and pop are used by container heap to add and remove a task to and from the slice respectively, while also maintaining the heap parameters. We can demonstrate that our heap interface implementation is correct by creating several different tasks with different timestamps and pushing them onto the heap in an arbitrary order. So if I run this, running the example, we can see that the tasks which are scheduled for sooner will be invoked first, causing the numbers to print in increasing order until the heap is completely empty. The group type must now manage an internal monitor Go routine along with the necessary context to cancel that Go routine later on. The delayed method will also return this time around, but this time around, it becomes a wrapper for the generalized schedule method. Schedule deals with absolute time time values rather than a time duration value like delay does. As a special case, a negative delay or past scheduled time will result in a task being executed immediately. The monitor go routine will manage a central timer which pulls for task readiness. I decided to go with the value of one millisecond at first just to see what would happen, but this caused some performance problems that we'll dive into later on. The trigger method is invoked regularly by monitor to examine the task, first task on the heap and determine if it is ready to run. So whenever trigger is called, it's possible for more than one task to be ready to run. So we'll continue the loop until the first task in the heap is no longer ready. Finally, waits will allow the caller to determine if all of the outstanding tasks have been completed. The context pass to new can also short circuit this wait operation, but otherwise we will continuously pull for readiness until no more tasks are left in the heap. When wait returns, we can cancel the monitor go routine as well. So if I run this example, this should look pretty familiar. <laughs> Putting it all together, we can see that this version of SCED group also behaves as expected, but there's actually a big problem with this prototype. When I deployed this code in Core Rad on my router, I noticed a significant increase in the process's CPU usage. To fully understand the situation, I decided to try out Go Tool Trace to visualize the process's CPU usage. In the current zoomed out image, it might be a little difficult to spot the subtle red and pink banding in the procs section, but this sort of banding pattern often indicates a problem. By zooming in on a 100 millisecond slice, we can see repeated small periods of CPU utilization as Go routines thrash between different OS threads running on my CPU. So this is a direct effect of the timer polling sched group prototype. For optimal efficiency and performance, we want to see either sustained CPU usage or no CPU usage at all in these sorts of scenarios. So this prototype is ultimately a step back from the previous one, but we learned some valuable lessons along the way. You really should be cautious of any sort of polling in your applications, or you may end up wasting a lot of CPU time and resources doing effectively no work. And because the monitor and wait methods both have to pull for readiness in this program, this problem is multiplied we need to take a totally different approach with our next prototype. Finally, we have arrived at our final SCED group design. This prototype ultimately became the final package, which you can use in your own applications. Another conversation with Egon in Gopher Slack also led to this design. So Go's channels allow passing messages between different Go routines in an efficient way. The select statement allows us to coordinate sending and receiving channel messages to execute different code paths. By combining Go's concurrency primitives and runtime timers, 
we can produce a design that meets all of our needs. On-demand Go routine creation, efficient CPU usage, and no more time of polling, thankfully. Some of the good ideas from the previous prototype are carried over into this design as well. A min heap is actually the perfect data structure for determining which tasks must be scheduled first, and the monitor Go routine allows for uh, complicated scheduling logic to be completely hidden away from the caller, so you don't have to worry about it in your own code. The group type has a few exported entry points, the delay and schedule methods, and wait. Context cancellation is supported throughout to enable immediately halting scheduling more tasks when no more work should be done. The monitor Go routine uses a select statement to wait for context cancellation or a new task to be added by schedule or for a timer tick indicating that an existing task is ready to run. When monitor invokes trigger, trigger will check if tasks are ready to run. And if none are, it sends the number of remaining tasks to wait and returns early. However, if a task deadline expires, trigger will execute it immediately by popping it off the heap, running it in a Go routine, and then reporting the number of remaining tasks to wait. The group type is still our foundation, but this time we have a couple of internal channels which are used for signaling between the monitor and calling Go routines. Add C sends a notification that a task was added to the heap, and Land C indicates the number of tasks left in the heap after a trigger call returns to the monitor Go routine. Delay and schedule will push a new task onto the heap and then notify the monitor Go routine by sending on add C. Breaking it down even further, this is a non-blocking select send attempt on add C. If monitor is within its select statement waiting for a channel to be ready, the value is sent and monitor can proceed. Otherwise, the default case here will fire and nothing will happen. Either way, we don't block the caller and the task ends up being scheduled. So why use an empty struct in this case rather than a bool? For me, it's a personal preference. I think the empty struct clearly communicates that the value is meaningless and should not be perceived as some sort of success or failure. Others may feel differently and that's okay too. Monitor is a bit more complex this time around. After checking for context cancellation, it will trigger any tasks that are ready as of the current time. Trigger will now return the deadline of the next task. And if there's a non-zero deadline, we can reset our timer to fire at that time and initialize tick C for the upcoming select. Otherwise, we stop the timer until another task is scheduled. This select statement is where our use of Go concurrency primitives truly shines. We can wait for context cancellation, or for addition of a new task, or for tick C to fire, which indicates that another task is ready to be run. If the timer was stopped above because no tasks are in the heap, tick C will be nil, effectively shutting off that case in the select statement. This is a really handy trick to remember. So whenever trigger is called by monitor, it acquires a mutex to prevent concurrent work scheduling. We defer a call which will send the number of items remaining in the heap on len C, which will signal to wait. If wait has already been called, it consumes the signal to check for completion, meaning no more tasks are left. If not, the default case will fire and nothing will happen. Within the body of trigger, we consume tasks from the heap until there are none left or until all the remaining tasks must wait for their deadline to pass. Each task which has reached its deadline will be executed in a go routine to avoid blocking trigger. And trigger will either return the deadline of the next task in the heap, so whichever one is ready to be fired next, or a zero time. Monitor can then use these values to determine whether or not to actually start its timer and enable or disable the tick C select case. Finally, let's examine wait. It will block until all tasks in a group have been run or until the context passed to new is canceled. Both wait and trigger will depend on a mutex to inspect the tasks heap and determine if tax task execution is complete. This code was surprisingly tricky to get right. So typically in Go, you'd want to defer unlock a mutex as a best practice. But I, when I initially used that pattern here, I ran into numerous deadlocks in this code. If your program is ever stuck, like perhaps blocked on a mutex, you can use control plus backslash to send a sig quit to your Go program, which will immediately dump all the Go routine stacks to the console. That's a very useful thing. Since trigger sends the number of tasks left in the heap as it returns, we select on CTX done and len C to determine when to unblock. Context cancellation is checked frequently to ensure we don't do any unnecessary work when the caller has asked us to abandon the remaining tasks. If no more tasks are left in the heap, then we can cancel the monitor go routine and return, thus ending the sched group lifecycle. So we have the demo one more time if we run this. We can see that our final demo code does exactly what we want, success. 
So this final event-driven approach is inherently complex and contains some slightly tricky uses of Go concurrency. But thanks to a solid test suite, I feel comfortable using this code in my production applications. Only a single timer is needed to coordinate tasks, there's no more timer polling, and Go routines are spun up on demand, exactly when they're needed. In the future, I may add an optional buffered channel semaphore to limit the number of concurrent Go routines executing. Now that we've built our final prototype, it's time for a head-to-head -head comparison with our initial naive prototype, which used time.afterfunk. The CPU usage on both should be comparable due to Go routines sleeping and waiting for timers to wake them up, so we'll specifically examine the number of running Go routines and the in-use heap space. For comparison, we'll reuse the demo, which creates 1 million tasks that atomically increment a counter. We create the sked group, create the tasks, which will sleep for 10 seconds each so we can gather measurements during that time, and then wait for all the tasks to complete. The naive prototype uses time after funk, which will spin up a Go routine on the caller's behalf to wait for the delay to elapse unless the timer is canceled. As a result, we end up with roughly 1 million parked Go routines waiting for a select statement to unblock. Since the final sked group package only skins up a Go, uh, spins up a Go routine when necessary, we see a massive reduction in the number of running Go routines while waiting for the tasks to fire, from 1 million down to 3. And one of those is the pprof call, so this is a lot more efficient. Of course, this task will eventually execute 1 million Go routines once the delay for each task elapses, but it doesn't need to create them until exactly the time that they're needed, which is the advantage. Next, we want to examine the in-use heap space. For this, I've chosen a flame graph because it provides a better view of the amount of memory a function call is using in relation to other functions. Runtime m start is the top heap space consumer here. So this function creates new worker or machine threads known as m's in Go terminology. This means that the runtime had to create a large number of threads up front in order to schedule all of the time after funk Go routines. The next top consumer we see is space consumed by the state stored within the time after funk. The final package consumes much less memory while waiting for tasks to be scheduled because it doesn't need to create any threads for the Go routines to run until each task is ready to be scheduled. This results in roughly a 6x reduction in the in-use heap bytes while awaiting task completion. It's worth noting that this number will also inflate when the Go routines must actually be started, but not beforehand. Group delay is the top memory consumer for this test, but it seems to consume a few less megabytes of memory than the time after funk equivalent. In summary, I believe the ideal approach to tackling this sort of problem is to create a prototype, measure its performance, and use those measurements to challenge your assumptions and make incremental improvements. My primary goals when writing code are always correctness and readability. Performance optimization, while important, is a secondary goal that must be justified through benchmark and profile evidence. I was pleasantly surprised to see how well the Go runtime handles large numbers of timers, especially as of the improvements in Go 1.14. So maybe it wasn't strictly necessary for me to build out my own package to manage timers and Go routines, but I had a ton of fun doing it and I learned a lot along the way. You can check out the final package on GitHub at MDLayerSched Group. And again, I'd like to give special thanks to Egon Elbray for his help with the two initial prototypes that inspired me to build out this package. I definitely could not have done this without his help. You can learn more about the Go timer improvements on Go issue 6239 and if you'd like to check out CoreRad to learn more about IPv6, you can find the project on GitHub and an introduction on my blog. That's all I have. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you much. Um, uh, like I said in the beginning, we, we asked Matt initially which charity, which organization uh, you should donate to, and uh, Matt chose Black Lives Matter. Um, again, we have a few minutes. If you have any questions, please uh, post them on the chat. Uh, or as um, I think Matt put his, his uh, how you can reach him on the on his slides, uh, and it is also available on the on Go for Slack. Mm -hmm. uh, going once. Going twice. Uh, okay, okay. Thank you so much, uh, much. Um, we'll take a quick break uh, and then we'll be back uh, shortly. Yep. Thank you all so much.